Fasten your seatbelts and prepare for a thrilling journey into the realm of elite piloting, the world of night carrier landings. Imagine this, a vast churning ocean under the cloak of darkness, a speck of a ship cutting through the waves, and a pilot hurtling towards it in a high-performance jet. This is where nerves of steel meet unparalleled skill, where cutting-edge technology becomes an extension of the human spirit. Today we'll be co-piloting alongside a fearless aviator as they attempt this seemingly impossible feat, landing a plane on a moving platform in the dead of night. Get ready to witness a breathtaking display of human courage and technological marvel. At the end of a mission, planes return to the ship using one of three approaches depending on the weather condition. Case 1 during good weather and daylight, Case 3 at night during poor weather, and Case 2 a mix of the other two in mediocre weather. Each approach follows standard procedures, routes and altitudes to ensure the safe recovery of all planes involved. The returning aircraft are closely monitored by air traffic controllers in the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center. These skilled sailors ensure the safe return of all aircraft and possess the same expertise as their civilian counterparts. Interestingly, they're about the only personnel on the ship who can give an officer an order that the officer must obey without any consequences. The Carrier Air Traffic Control Center is a crucial part of carrier aviation, ensuring the safe return of all aircraft involved in a mission. Regular flight operations consist of a cycle that lasts approximately 90 minutes and involves 10 to 12 aircraft taking off. At the beginning of each cycle, planes are launched to clear the flight deck, allowing the crew to reposition the remaining aircraft for the next recovery. Space is a precious commodity on the carrier. Any opportunity to acquire more space is taken quickly and efficiently. Therefore, launching aircraft at the start of each cycle is an essential part of carrier operations. The arresting wires on an aircraft carrier are numbered, with the most aft wire being designated as number one and the most forward wire as number four. The target wire that pilots aim to catch during a landing is known as number three due to its close proximity to the back end of the ship. Pilots generally try to avoid the number one wire. While each pilot is graded on each pass of the ship, catching any of the wires is considered a success, given the difficulty of the task. During the landing process, the pilot sets the throttles to full power without afterburner upon hitting the landing area of the deck. This is done as a precaution, in case the aircraft fails to catch one of the wires, allowing the plane to have enough power to get airborne again. If the aircraft fails to catch a wire and subsequently gets airborne again, it's known as a bolter. However, if the aircraft fails to catch a wire and doesn't get airborne again, the pilot would need to eject from the airplane, as the margin of error is small during carrier landings. Pilots must remain alert and execute the proper procedures to ensure a successful landing. After an attempted landing, aircraft enter the bolter pattern, which is a level oval racetrack pattern above the ship. If the aircraft needs to refuel, the pilot elevates to the tanker pattern located above the bolter pattern. When an aircraft is low on fuel, air operations designate an airborne tanker to hawk for the low fuel state aircraft. During nighttime and adverse weather conditions, aircraft initially enter a complex holding pattern called the Marshall Stack. The pattern can be visualized as a stack of pancakes above the ship, with each pancake being a separate pattern. Altitude between patterns is the primary method of separation to keep track of all the aircraft involved in the operation. The departure and recovery status boards, along with a graphic depiction of the pattern called Mr. Hands, reflect the location of every airborne aircraft in real time. When an aircraft checks in with the Marshall controller in the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center, it provides a fuel state and a side number. The term state is used to define how much fuel the aircraft has left, expressed in pounds and shortened to two numbers. For instance, if a Hornet with aircraft side number 301 has 6,500 pounds of fuel remaining, the pilot would say 301 state 6.5. Within seconds, the pilot receives instructions on where to hold position behind the ship, which recovery pattern to use, and when to hit the push point. 
The push point is a critical moment that marks the start of the landing procedure, and pilots must be ready to execute their duties flawlessly. Air ops serve as the nerve center of night flying operations on the aircraft carrier, tracking all planes launched and about to recover on two status boards. These boards display critical information such as fuel states, aircraft missions, pilot names, aircraft side numbers, landing attempts, and other important details to ensure everyone on board has access to this information. It is transmitted through the ship's internal TV system. One channel on the internal TV shows a live view from the landing area looking back towards the stern of the ship allowing pilots to watch their colleagues landing or use it as a tool to evaluate their own passes. This channel is available in various areas on the ship, including the bridge, air operations primary flight control, where the air boss sits, and all the ready rooms. As a pilot, you're about to face a difficult night landing on the aircraft carrier. The weather conditions are challenging with a broken layer of clouds at 2,000 feet above the water and scattered layers up to 15,000 feet, as well as nearby thunderstorms with the closest divert 400 miles away. The carrier is your only option tonight. The sea state has worsened, causing the ship to pitch considerably. If you were to tune in to the final control frequency, you would hear landing signal officers shouting power to pilots attempting to land. However, it's best to focus on your own landing and stay in your box. As a naval aviator, preparing to land your aircraft on a ship at night requires a great deal of skill and attention to detail. As you cross the push point at exactly 2200, you double check the time in your watch against the clock in the jet and calmly inform the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center that you're commencing and have 6.0 or 6,000 pounds of fuel remaining. You begin your descent toward the ship at what's known as platform altitude, which is 5,000 feet above sea level. Below this altitude, it's considered a dangerous place to be at night, so the platform call serves as a safety reminder. However, tonight's flight is not clear. Layers of clouds obscure your vision of the other aircraft in front of you, requiring a full instrument approach to the landing. At 10 miles from the ship, you stop your descent at 1,200 feet and report your position to the Air Traffic Control Center, who instructs you to stay clean through 10, which helps with spacing the aircraft. You hold off on configuring your aircraft for landing until just before you reach 8 miles from the ship, which is indicated by the Takan display. Then you quickly run through the landing checklist, lowering the landing gear, flaps, and a resting hook. You double check all the settings and note your fuel state. At this point, you're six miles away from the ship and only have less than two minutes until your first pass. As the pilot approaches the carrier to land back on the ship, air operations are getting tense. There are currently three aircraft that have had trouble catching the wire and have bolted due to the ship pitching up and down in the rough seas. There are two in the bolter pattern, and the other has been sent to rendezvous with an airborne tanker to refuel because his fuel state was too low to make another pass. The decision was made by air operations in consultation with the squadron representative. A senior member of each squadron in the air wing is standing watch at air ops during the recovery period. They're there to help monitor their respective aircraft and relay information back to the individual squadrons. However, the captain of the ship calls down to inform air ops that he has to turn the ship slightly to find the relative wind. This could cause more issues than what's already happening, as the ship cannot be in a turn while the aircraft are attempting to land. However, finding the appropriate amount of relative wind is crucial in carrier operations. Without enough wind over the deck, landing signal officers will wave off aircraft for safety reasons and force them to go around again. Sometimes the ship will chase the wind incessantly. As you approach the ship, your aircraft's ILS, or instrument landing system, picks up the bullseye signal, which provides glide, slope azimuth, and elevation signals to your heads-up display, guiding you to a good start position. This is where you're on center line, intercepting the glide slope, 
about three quarters of a mile behind the ship at 360 feet above the water, descending at a controlled rate of 650 to 750 feet per minute and on speed. The ACLS system locks onto your aircraft to help you get into this position, while the ILS system only provides one-way communication. Making timely corrections to the rate of descent is essential as the runway in front of you is a moving target. Once you're three quarters of a mile from the ship, control of your aircraft is handed over to the landing signal officers who are positioned on either side of the landing area. At this point, it's critical that you're in a good starting position to increase your chances of a successful landing. As you approach the carrier for landing, the pitching deck caused by the rough seas makes it difficult to determine your position using the glide slope indicator or meat ball. Instead, you rely on the landing signal officers, who will give you verbal feedback via radio calls. The carrier itself is massive, but even the largest swells don't usually affect it. However, tonight, the swells are causing the stern of the ship to rise and fall dramatically. This makes it hard to focus on a fixed object and can be disorienting. The stern of the ship rises up and points directly at you for one to two seconds before falling again, creating a repeating cycle like a carousel ride. As you touch down on the deck, you hear a slight ping-ping sound, but you don't feel the arresting wire catch your plane. You quickly check that you're at military power, maintain your aircraft's altitude, and prepare to climb away. After missing the arresting wires, the pilot has to deal with a low fuel state that requires tanking. Departure control is notified of the situation, and the pilot continues to fly the wave-off bolter pattern until departure provides steering directions to the tanker. Due to adverse weather conditions, the tankers are flying above the clouds, making it difficult to spot and reach them. The pilot spots the flashing lights of the tanker and joins in from the inside while extending the aircraft's refueling probe. With a storm nearby, it's critical to make this a quick evolution and get back to the carrier. On board the carrier, the tension is mounting as the ship is having difficulty bonding in a calm sea state, resulting in missed arrests. The air wing representatives and air ops are becoming increasingly frustrated and there's another bolter. The train is slowly wrecking and the situation is becoming more intense. The Carrier Air Traffic Control Center hooks you back into the direction of the ship with a steering vector. It's time to repeat the process methodically. You go through the same procedures. Configuring your aircraft properly to land, carefully flying with what your heads-up display is telling you to do, and praying that the ship finds a moment of calm when you get there. You arrive three quarters of a mile behind the ship and pick up the meatball. You're confident and cautiously optimistic. From this position, there's only about 20 seconds to touch down. The ship has very few lights on it, just a small outline of a box in the landing area and a few lights off to the starboard side near the tower. Darkness is the theme. You continue to focus on the meatball, listening to the landing signal officer give you a soft little power call. You adjust your throttles ever so slightly and find an angle of attack to keep the aircraft just above the glide slope. You don't want to get overpowered, close and cause a bolt. Precision is the master key to success during the most critical part of the boarding process. As you get closer, your peripheral vision picks up more of the ship. Things start to move faster in your brain and a feeling of ground rush, or in this case, ship rush, begins to overtake your senses. The plane descends over the stern of the ship and down into the landing area. The few ship's lights whiz past. At the moment of touchdown, you can feel the landing gear thud onto the carrier deck. You already have the throttles at full military power. There's a split second where you're waiting for that feeling of deceleration, knowing the hook has grabbed a wire. This is the moment that separates carrier aviators from all others. You feel the deceleration first in your shoulder harness straps, then in your head, and finally in your whole body as you violently move forward in the ejection seat. 
The aircraft tugs on the wire and pulls it out like a rubber band, bringing you to a violent but very welcome stop. The initial feeling is a sense of relief, followed by a recognition of just how difficult that entire evolution was. You notice your knee shaking as you retract the arresting hook and flaps and then taxi out of the landing area. Congratulations on a successful landing. You've added a thick layer to your aviator's soul. What an incredible journey we've been on, witnessing the intense skill and precision required to land a plane on a moving aircraft carrier in the middle of the night. It's truly a testament to the bravery and expertise of these pilots, and we hope you've enjoyed experiencing a small glimpse into this challenging world. We want to hear from you. Phew, that was an intense look at the world of night carrier landings. The skill and focus required by these pilots are truly awe-inspiring. Did you find yourself white-knuckling it through the landing? Let us know in the comments below. And if you have any questions about carrier aviation, fire away. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more exciting content like this. Thanks for joining us.